were ready to move in and confront Pharaoh now. And afterward, Moses and Aaron went in and told Pharaoh. Remember, Pharaoh is a title representing the representative of the sun god, Ra. Thus saith the Lord Jehovah, God of Israel, Elohim, let my people go that they may hold a feast unto me in the wilderness. Now see, this was logical from both points of view. It was logical from Moses and Aaron point of view. You had to start somewhere. You couldn't just say, we're leaving you forever. And it wasn't a lie because they certainly would have gone into the wilderness away from all the idolatry and he'd have been able to teach them about Jehovah and offer proper sacrifices. But he's not telling all he knows. That's very wise, certainly to the adversary's realm. And when you're dealing in the world, you don't tell the world all you know. You tell them enough to make your decisions and then it's between you and God. You don't owe the doggone world any obligation to tell them everything that's in your heart whether it's dealing with your families or dealing with your finances or dealing with your life. That's what I hate about this debt stuff, too. When you go in debt, then, you're, then you owe to tell that bank or tell that loan company or whoever you owe the money to or tell the government everything about your stupid life. Every nickel you make, who you make it from, every check you write, every place you spend your money. You see how the adversary just tricking you? where you have to tell the infidel everything going on in your private financial affairs. Man, take charge of your life. You're enslaved. You're under Egypt's taskmasters. It's a disgrace. It's nobody's business but you and who you want to know. My goodness. It ought to just get, you know, once you see the word, it ought to just, first off, you feel mad, then you're foolish, then you're humiliated. And then you make up your mind to do something about it, don't you? Get the Word of God in your heart and start taking on the enemy, point by point, bit by bit. All he told him was all that stupid Pharaoh needed to know. Because from Pharaoh's point of view, it made sense too, because there's a scripture here in chapter 8. That tells you, in verse 25... And Pharaoh called for Moses and for Aaron and said, Go ye, sacrifice to your God in the land. Now this is after four plagues had gotten his attention. And he says, Okay, go do what you were said you were going to do, sacrifice. And Moses said, It is not meet so to do, for we shall sacrifice the abomination of the Egyptians to the Lord our God. Lo, shall we sacrifice the abomination of the Egyptians before their eyes, and will they not stone us? All Pharaoh was willing to concede was, you can sacrifice, but you have to do it here. Remember Moses said we need to go three days' journey into the wilderness. Maybe we didn't read that part yet. But he said we have to go into the wilderness. Yes, it, later it says three days. Moses' argument is very logical because it was an abomination. The animals that the is, Hebrews used in sacrifice or abomination to the Egyptian religious mindset. Sheep and swine. And so therefore it would have been so insulting to the Egyptians that sheep were being sacrificed that they would have attacked the Israel people and stoned them. Would have started all kinds of riots. So see it's illogical from Pharaoh's point of view not to let them go sacrifice and Moses points this out. Isn't that intriguing? See all the thinking going on here? Moses knew that culture. He was raised in it, remember? He knew the culture. By the way, that's another point. Remember, you've read those sections perhaps where Moses says to God, I am not eloquent. I can't speak in Pharaoh's court. That didn't mean Moses stuttered and stammered like some commentaries have written. It didn't mean he had a speech impediment like preachers have said. It also did not mean that he was shy and timid and full of fear. Are you kidding me, Moses? All it meant was for 40 years he hadn't lived in Egypt. He'd forgotten the language. That's all. He'd been speaking the tongue of the Midianites for 40 years. He'd forgotten the Egyptian tongue. He needed an interpreter. That's all it meant. And you'll see in the Word by the end of this whole series of events, Moses is directly speaking to Pharaoh himself because the language came back to him once he got back there. Understand? It wasn't that he was afraid or God would have confronted him about fear. 
God doesn't confront him about fear. He, it, it was that he could no longer speak the language. That's why Aaron, who apparently had kept himself well-versed in the language, matter of fact, Aaron was still in Egypt. Sure he was. Aaron was an older brother. He wasn't under the edict of the, young, of the sons being killed. Aaron was still in Egypt. Aaron came to meet Moses on his way back to Egypt. There you go. Aaron was speaking the language. He'd been speaking the language all those years. Isn't that incredible? So see, that explains that. They don't read the word. They just jump, hop, and then they blame Moses for being fearful. That's inconsistent. Ah, I'm glad I came this morning just to put that together. See? Been studying this stuff for, all, for hours already, but got so much here, you got to isolate it one at a time. But that's tremendous. It would have been a disgrace to the Egyptians, so it made sense to go three days in. See, Revelation is just the best. Goes back to chapter 5, verse 2, and Pharaoh said, and here's his attitude here. That's why it's important for us to read this. Who is the Lord? Who is Jehovah? I don't know him. That I should obey his voice to let Israel go. I know not Jehovah, neither will I let Israel go. He said, I know Horus, and I know Osiris, and I know Isis, and I know Ra, but who's Jehovah? See, they're all names to him. Who's Jehovah? And he certainly had never seen an image to Jehovah. Every god he knew of had an image. Either looked like a big ugly crocodile or something, you know. And they said, the God, Jehovah, of the Hebrews, hath met with us. He had. He had by way of the burning bush. He had given them other revelations. Let us go, we pray thee. There it is, three days' journey into the desert. Three is the number for completeness. It would have gotten them completely out of the idolatrous impact. That was the initial, Im the initial goal of their leaving, three days' journey. You know, you have to lead people along step by step. We certainly know that in our ministry. We have to lead people along step by step. Get them to one step, then we can go to the next, then the next. That's what was doing here. Journey into the desert and sacrifice unto Jehovah our Elohim, lest he fall upon us with pestilence or with the sword. That's simply a Hebrew idiom. Remember, they had no knowledge of a personal adversary yet. It's the way they said things. It didn't mean God would put a pestilence on them or a sword. It meant if they didn't love and honor God, they had no protection. Same with your life and mine. If we don't love and honor God, God cannot protect us. That's all that means. It's our free will choice. Verse 4, And the king of Egypt said unto them, Wherefore do ye, Moses and Aaron, let the people from their works get you under your burden? See that? Now he's hacked off because the people had quit working. They're slaves. And Pharaoh said, Behold, the people of the land now are many, and you make them rest from their burdens. Apparently they'd gone on strike. And Pharaoh commanded the same day the taskmasters of the people and their officers, saying, You shall no more give the people straw to make brick. See, to make their clay brick, it had to have some kind of sustenance to hold together. And that was stubble, either wheat or barley stubble, to mix it with the mortar and the clay type material so the brick would hold together. So now, but the, the stubble was always provided by the Egyptians. They'd at least bring the stubble in and then they'd stand over and beat on them to make the bricks if they didn't work. Now he's putting more hardship on it. We're not even going to supply the materials to make the brick. You got to go out and get it yourself, bring it back, and then you have to keep your quotas up. See what the adversary's doing? Putting fear and pressure on him. This is all he's got to do. He does fear, he does all this stuff. So that's what he tells them. Verse 7, ye shall no more give the people straw to make brick as heretofore. Let them go and gather straw for themselves. And the tale of the bricks which they did make heretofore ye shall lay upon them. Ye shall not diminish aught thereof, for they be idle. Yeah, right. Well, they sat for one day after nearly 140 years of slavery. Therefore they cry, saying, Let us go and sacrifice to our God. That was his logic. Let their more work be laid upon the men, that they may labor therein, 
and let them not regard vain words. He just called the word of the Lord vain words, didn't he? It's like Jeremiah 23, 36 that I read last night where Jeremiah said to the copped out priests and prophets, ye do pervert the words of the living God. He called them vain words. 